Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Antriksh and I would be your host for the day. At Hardware.io, we come together to put our brains into discussing the latest innovation in attacking and defending hardware. The objective of the conference revolves around key concerns related to hardware, firmware, and related protocols. Today's webinar is going to talk about denoising of Tempest images on efficient optical character recognition by Santiago and Yuan. They both are researchers at Technology and Innovation Institute of Abu Dhabi. Uh, so a quick announcement for the format of the webinar. 30 minutes would be the presentation and 10 minutes would be given for Q&A. All those participants who have joined us and would like to ask questions to our speakers, you could ask your questions in the chat option on Zoom and they would be answered at the end of the presentation. I would like to also thank both our speakers to present this latest research of theirs uh, on our hardware.io platform because it's yet not published uh, completely in a journal. There's a pretext available for download. Uh, I forget the publication house, uh, but I will get back to you on that very soon. Quick announcement about our upcoming webinars. We have two webinars scheduled this in this month on the 6th of July by Mark and followed by 30th of July by Alex. So if you're interested in this topic, please join us as well as uh, after this presentation, we expect you to give us a feedback so that whatever you like, what you didn't like, that, that will help us improve for our future webinars. And the last, we have our upcoming trainings for scheduled in the month of September. We have nine amazing hardware researchers presenting and delivering and sharing their knowledge to the community. So please join us. Uh, for now, Yuan and Santiago, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Antrix. So good evening, good evening everyone. I will share my screen. So please excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So as you said, uh, today's webinar is called Deep Learning Based on the Noising of Tempest Images for Efficient Optical Character Recognition. Uh, this consists on two parts. The first part is going to be presented by me and the second part by Juan. So in this first part, I'm going to present a little review of what is Tempest, the history of Tempest, and how we can, re how we can reconstruct uh, video frames from uh, remote uh, video interfaces, a remote display monitor. So for the first part from electromagnetic emanations back to video frames. Uh, something about the history of TEMPEST. TEMPEST is an acronym for Telecommunications Electronics Materials Protected from Emanating Spurious Transmissions. It is a United States National Security Agency specification and a NATO certification. And uh, it established the requirements for military equipment uh, protection against uh, unintentional electromagnetic emanations, sound, and vibrations. So it has been known by military organizations as early as, six, as the 60s of the past century that uh, electromechanical devices emanate uh, uh, unintended uh, electromagnetic signals, or sometimes also sound and, and physical vibration. And with, from these um, emanations, uh, information can be recovered. So this is an info, a security leakage. Uh, this was known uh, by, in the, by the open public in 1984 when the Swedish government uh, issued a, a thin book page booklet with technical details of how this uh, phenomena worked at the time. And in 1985, uh, Bim Banek published an unclassified technical analysis of the security risks on CRT monitors. In, early, in the early uh, 2000s, Marcus Kuhn demonstrated that this also happened on, on LCD monitors. So 
how is uh, what is happening so we are connecting an external uh, display monitor with a video interface the two most known uh, uh, video interfaces at the moment are VGA and HDMI and the information that is traveling through the cable from the PC to the display monitor is also transmitting uh, electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic waves if we capture this uh, these electromagnetic emanations we can reconstruct video frames uh, I want to explain you how this is done, but uh, I will explain you with BGA. I think from my point of view, it's easy, easily understandable, this phenomena from the BGA point of view, but this also happens with HDMI. It, this phenomena happens with these two inter interfaces and also with other, other interfaces like DVI. So how this is happening uh, we have this um, connector uh, a VGA connector the main pins of this connector are the blue green and red channels uh, also we have the horizontal synchronization pulse the vertical synchronization pulse and for example let's assume that we are transmitted a full HD resolution of 1920 uh, uh, pixels per 1080 lines at a frame rate of, of 60 hertz. If there is, this is our resolution and, and this is our refresh, refreshing rate, the pixel clock in this standard is going to be 148.5 megahertz. This frequency is important. We have to have in mind this frequency. But in reality, we are seeing only a portion of the screen, a portion of this data, because in reality, the total quantity of data that is being transmitted is 2,200 pixels uh, in, in width and 1,125 uh, lines in height. So why is this happening? Because the display monitor needs these uh, like blank spaces to synchronize its internal clocks. So we have this horizontal back porch, this horizontal front porch, this horizontal synchronization, synchronization pulse, the vertical back porch and the vertical front porch and a vertical synchronization pulse. So in total, we are having this amount of information. Okay. Also, it is important to have in mind that VGI is an analog, uh, transmit, uh, an analog video interface. That means that each channel is transmitting uh, from 0 volts to 0 0.7 volts, sometimes a little more, but normally this is, this is the standard. Uh, and to transmit a, a middle tone red, we will have to uh, go into the middle of the range. For example, here we are transmitting a uh, 0 0.35 volts and green and blue channels must remain at zero volts if we want to transmit a pure red tone uh, we have to go to 0 0.7 volts and green and blue again have to remain at zero volts and it ha this happens also with green and blue channels so the combination of these three channels and uh, and ranging from these zero volts to 0 0.7 volts is the uh, is what makes the appearance of the of colors in each pixels in each pixel so we are repeating this li line by li by line in what is called a rasterized video interface so we here we can see that we go uh, to 1080 lines but we have also 36 uh, lines for the vertical uh, back porch and four lines for the front uh, vertical front porch and five lines for the synchronization pulse in this standard, for example, the pixel time is more or less 6.7 nanoseconds. A line is 40 microseconds, uh, for, uh, 14, excuse me, microseconds. And, at, and the total frame is going to be transmitted in uh, 16 milliseconds. Here we can see also what is happening when we are transmitting uh, a gray scale from black to white. For example, in white, we have the three channels going to the top of 0 0.7 volts. But, uh, but in reality, this is very ideal. We, we, we will never achieve these square uh, shapes of the signals. So in reality, every pixel has more or less this 
di different forms. And the pixel shape is something we normally don't know. For example, here we have two manufacturers or different graphic cards. And for example, the, the green and the black uh, shapes are, for, uh, are transmitting at exactly the same frequency, the same resolution, and are transmitting exactly the same information. But you can see that the pixel shape is really different. Why is this happening? Because from the manufacturer's point of view, uh, what it is important is to achieve a precise voltage at a precise time. The rest of the pixel shape, it really doesn't matter. So uh, this is something important to have in mind because at the end we are dealing with a very complex system. What are the difficulties for capturing the video frames? Uh, first of all, we don't, we don't really know the, the spectral density of the source video signal. Uh, we don't know the pixel shape. We don't know how, what data is being transmitted at that point in time. And this also is varying all the time. So uh, this is uh, one difficulty. Also, we don't know the characteristics of the transmission line. We, have, we know we have a cable but this cable uh, normally varies in, in length, in, lo in longitude, and we cannot characterize it. And we don't know how this acts as an antenna. Also, uh, the signals involved in this process are very low power. As I told you, the peak voltage for a wide scale is 0 0.7 volts, and this uh, with the <laughs> impedance in, in the system are more or less in the, in the range of milliwatts. So uh, also we have electromagnetic interference from the environment and we also have uh, a transfer function, function that we normally don't know at, at the receiver. Also, uh, we are transmitting three, uh, we have three channels that are transmitting each one each, uh, a sequence of data information, and this probably goes to a construct or destructive interference. So these are the dif difficulties that make the system work like a, work like a block, uh, black box. But we also have some advantages. For example, we know that there is a streaming, a constant streaming of video signals. At the moment, the display monitor is going to stop. We will not. Uh, we know that if we are seeing information, we are seeing video in the display monitor, uh, is because there are uh, information traveling through the cable. Also, we know that there is an underlying central frequency. And this frequency, uh, for the specific case of the full HD, is again 148.7 megahertz at 60 hertz of refresh rate. This uh, frequency, we also know, we, it can be proved that uh, the spectrum of the baseband signal uh, is going to be repeated itself at the harmonics of, the, of this pixel frequency. And we also know that the bandwidth of the receiving signal is expected to be less or equal of, mm, of this frequency. Finally, we, we also know that there is a correlation between the amplitude of the signal and the intensity of the pixels in, 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 the, in the transmission, in the, in, the, in the transmitted data. This correlation means that it is not equal, but from this we can uh, reconstruct video frames. So, what tool we are using for this? Uh, normally, we, use, uh, we can use an SDR. And the main reasons are because, oh, obviously because they are cheap, but also because they have, they can be tuned in a wide range of frequencies from one megahertz to six gigahertz, for example, this one. Uh, and they also have a decent bandwidth for these tax. Mm, for example, this one has a 20 megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, maybe this is not enough to recover the whole uh, spectral density of the base baseband signal, but, uh, it allows us to recover part of the information. So uh, we did a, a little experiment here in green. I am showing you the harmonics of this frequency of full HD. Uh, again, 148.5 megahertz. 
here is the first, the second, the third, and so on are harmonic. And in blue, I'm showing you the quality of the recovered video frame. So at the first harmonic, we can see that we can recover somehow the information, although the quality is not very good. Uh, at the second and third harmonic, we are not easily, we cannot recover easily the information. Maybe there is, there is interference in that part of the spectrum, but at the fourth and fifth harmonic, the information can be recovered easily. How does the look, this look? Here we have our reference image. Here is how it looks at, uh, at, uh, at recovering at, at this first harmonic. Uh, and you can see it, there is information there, although it is not very good. And the second, third harmonic, you cannot see anything, but at the fourth and fifth harmonic, harmonic you really can see that there is a reconstruction of the image there. Okay, so how this is done. Uh, here I'm showing you the spectral density uh, of the uh, SDR centered at 610 megahertz. Um, and you can see that this is all the energy that is being transmitted by the video interface. Why do we know this? Because uh, here in this waterfall uh, plot, we can see how this was transmitting inf information. Here uh, we turn off the display monitor and here we turn it on again and we can, it's evident that the energy goes away and comes back. So how do we recover this? Uh, as I told you, the amplitude, uh, the envelope of the baseband signal is related to the intensity of the pixels. So at the end, what we are doing is an, uh, an AM demodulation. And this is something that is trivial on an SDR because in an SDR to obtain the amplitude of a baseband signal, we only have to uh, obtain the amplitude of the in-phase and quadrature uh, information of the, of, of, of the SDR. So once we have our set of amplitudes, we have to go to a process that is called resampling. For example, imagine we have this reference image and in this reference image, if we are sampling at 20 megahertz, if you do the maths, you will reach to the point that per line, we are obtaining 148 samples. But in reality, we know that one line is composed of 2,200 pixels. So, uh, how do we convert this buffer into this buffer? Okay, it's a matter of resampling where we have to feed the data in this buffer, maybe repeat, uh, for example, this maybe something like uh, four, 15 times, but, some, but, but maybe the first sample 15 times, the second sample 14 times, this is done very carefully. If you don't do this very carefully in a synchronized way, you will not be able to uh, obtain your video frame. Here you can see after the resampling uh, process, we can see that there is something there, but it's, it is very ugly. It is terrible. How do we improve this? We use a serial of post-processing steps uh, where, for example, uh, we use low-pass filtering, auto gain, frame averaging, and we go from this to this, which is a, a lot better. So anyway, at this point, the frame is still not synchronized because we are not seeing, you, you can see it is not organized. We have to find this point. And after finding this point, we reorganize the information and we start to display displaying the data at the beginning of this point. So now here I'm showing you a, a little experiment with it. The setup, the setup here shows an HDMI interface, uh, and we can see that at five meters, we are recovering video frames. It is evident here that we can see what the display monitor is, uh, is, is showing. So uh, the conclusions of, of, of this first part are, um, we cannot recover color, but this doesn't matter because for recovering text, the this system is, is very suitable because normally text is a high contrast information. You know, text is black in uh, in front of a white background, 
and this tool will work very good for this. So having this in mind, I give the floor to Juan, who is going to explain how we can recover text from this. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Santiago. I'm gonna show my screen now. Mm. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, again, thanks for attending this um, webinar. Now I will, the idea is that I will show you how to process the intercepted images and so that we can obtain sharp images from which we can actually extract information, in particular text information. Um, uh, so I will start by explaining first the most important concepts of, this, of deep learning and why we are deciding to go with a data-driven approach. Then I will go through the work we've conducted to capture the data, train and evaluate the models that we've been working with uh, to pre-process the images so that we at the end can extract information from these images. So first um, I would like to start by briefly explaining the classic approach to programming with a with a simple example in the field of image processing. Let's say we want to uh, uh, segment or extract the position of this red ball from the image. Um, we can do this simply by taking the information from the image that is in the three color channel that are represented by three matrices and define uh, fixed thresholds so that we can um, extract the color and then calculate the center of the particular color. This is something that uh, works pretty well, that can be done easily, but um, then what happens if we want to, for example, detect another color or if the lighting conditions change? Like, there's a lot of things that can change in this setting and the threshold that we define from the, our knowledge of the image and of the color that we wanted to get will stop applying. So this is something that happens a lot um, in real world problems and in particular in uh, computer vision problems. Um, so now following this classical paradigm, uh, in a particular case, several approaches have been uh, studied in the field of image denoising. Uh, in general, these approaches rely on the knowledge that we have of the particular uh, images and of the noise distribution that we want to eliminate. So there is one of the state-of-the-art classical non-learn approaches that's called collaborative filtering. And um, we can see how this works in, in these images. It, it works pretty well for uh, the removal of uh, additive white gaussian noise. But if we try to process uh, our intercepted images with this, we get um, some pretty poor results. And this is due to the fact that these images are distorted by several effects that are not only additive gaussian noise. And we don't know the distribution of these um, effects. So this doesn't work in general for uh, our particular case. Um, then if we were, for example, to take one of the, a text image and add uh, additive white Gaussian noise with a distribution that we know, then this algorithm will be really good at eliminating that noise. But it's only because we synthetically added a known distribution of white Gaussian noise. So this won't apply for, for images, that's why um, and that's the, the main motivation to go with a data-driven approach. And um, so different from the paradigm of, of defining hard-coded rules, we have the, the, the paradigm of machine learning, um, where what we do is um, based on, on data, um, we train or adapt a mathematical model, which can be a neural network, for example, we, are that we train its parameters so that it performs a task or, uh, or resembles a function that is described by the data that we're giving in. So for example, if we had the problem, a uh, uh, common problem in, in image processing in computer vision, which is called uh, image segmentation, which uh, basically consists in taking an image and labeling each pixel, depending on whether it corresponds to uh, let's say a person or a motorcycle or any kind of object. So this is a problem that would be really hard to solve by classical approaches. So what we do here is um, we take images 
then we pass them through a, through a neural network, which initially has random parameters, random weights. Then it will perform a prediction, which will be really poor. Then we can compare that prediction with data that has been previously labeled. Then we compute an error or loss. And through a learning algorithm or an optimization algorithm, we uh, update the weights of the neural network so that it does a better prediction. So the idea behind this is that the more data that we show to the model, uh, the better it will start performing or the better it will start um, resembling the data. And um, this works pretty well in a lot of, uh, for a lot of problems and, and has made, made it possible to uh, tackle problems whose complexity was, impo was impossible to tackle with classical approaches. Um, so for example, this tweet, um, says gradient descent can write code better than you in some cases or in a lot of cases that is actually true but of course machine learning is not a silver bullet today it's mostly limited to certain domains and regularly those where capturing large amounts of data uh, is feasible or, and where the task complexity justifies capturing all these big amounts of data um, so now we have um, like I mentioned before, one of the most common models that are trained through machine learning are neural networks. And to understand neural networks, we must first understand the perception, which is uh, simply a mathematical model or a mathematical function which computes a weighted sum of a series of inputs and then passes this sum through what's called an activation function. And the idea behind, the, behind this weighted sum is that we can uh, tweak these parameters um, so that they perform the function that we want them to as good as possible. So a really simple example for, for this is linear regression. We, we train these two parameters, which are the slope of the curve and the intersection with the y axis, so that they um, are as close to a given data as possible. And that's something that's really commonly done. Also, another problem that can be solved through one of these perceptions is the problem of linear classification. So we, in the same way, we would try to find the parameters that describe a boundary decision line. Finally, um, some a really important part of the perception is the sigma is the activation function. And one example of this is, for example, the sigma function, which is uh, widely used, for example, to transform uh, the scores that we can get from from these uh, equation that defines the decision boundary to something that is closer to a probability that is at least bounded between zero and one. So that if we uh, get a data point that is on the line, for example, it will give us a score of zero and it will give us a probability of 0 0.5, which makes sense. If we have two classes, 50% probability of belonging to a certain class. And then if, it's, if the score is large, then it will give us a value closer to one or 100%. Um, but what happens when the phenomena that we want to model with these um, neural networks are more complex and have nonlinearities? What is basically done is um, what, what it's done is basically adding um, more of these units, more of these neurons, and uh, perform uh, and, and do have several layers of this so that we can achieve these nonlinearities. And um, to train these um, models. The, the procedure basically can be summarized in first computing a loss function that tells us how good our model um, uh, is, is, describes the data, how, how close it is to the data. And then we use gradient descent. Uh, for that, we calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to the parameters of the model. And uh, that will tell us the direction in which the weights should be updated so that the model performs better or, the, or it has a, a smaller loss. So that's, that can be seen in this uh, figure here, for example. We start with random weights at a high loss. That means our model performs poorly. And then as we move on, it starts moving in the direction where the loss decreases um, until it reaches an optimal point. Of course, this is not always that simple. There can be of uh, local minima or other effects that, that affect this. But that's the, the basic principle. Um, now that we discussed neural networks, how do we use them for image processing? 
usually it well it becomes almost impossible to use uh, this type of multi-layer perceptions for images mostly because it will require a large amount of parameters and also um, there's an important fact and it's that statistics of natural images obey invariants uh, which are intrinsic correlations among pixels. That means that if we have an image of a cat and we move the cat inside the image, it will still be a cat. Or if we rotate the cat, it will still be a cat. So that's where um, this operation emerges and this type of neural networks emerge, the convolutional neural networks. Uh, the, how the convolution works, I won't go into the detail, but it can be, it's depicted in this uh, figure here. We'll have what's called a convolutional kernel that slides through the input or through the image, basically and computes uh, output and it does so sharing weights among the whole image which reduces the parameters and takes advantage of the fact that uh, of, that there's this intrinsic correlation between pixels um, so basically what convolutional network networks end up doing is learning hierarchical representations of um, of the of the images so for example here in this image classification task they learn to first detect edges then detect uh, more complex shapes, blobs, and then at the end, uh, in a deeper layer, they will be able to detect things like eyes or mouths or other types of objects. And by extracting these features, then we can do really interesting tasks like image uh, classification. And this is one of the things that made these type of uh, models to explode basically and to have a lot of people using them in the field of computer vision is there that in 2012 uh, the progress and the advancements the advancements of gpus made it possible to use these uh, large models large convolutional neural networks to process images and it allows to allow to be to increase um, a lot the performance of uh, these type of models of of an image an image classification test so since then, uh, convolutional neural networks have taken over the field of computer vision, basically. Okay, so now after discussing these topics, uh, we'll, we go back to, to, to what we actually do to, to remove the noise out of these images, which is what we care about. So um, what we do basically, the process we follow is we first capture the data. And for this, what we do is we have uh, these images, these base images that are displayed in a, in a monitor and the, they have these um, calibration patterns here. And then we intercept these images through the process explained by Santiago. Uh, after we find the centers of these images through thresholding and we align the centers of the intercepted and the original image. This allows us to get uh, aligned pairs of images, uh, which is really important because originally these images were misaligned, skewed, displaced and resized. And then we, we, we do something called a data augmentation, which allows us to have more data and have more variability inside between among the data so that we can, uh, our model is a, even better at uh, generalizing for new types of data. Mm, then uh, once we have this data, we, what we do is basically train a model and in a fashion pretty similar to what I explained earlier is we have these set of noisy images, we pass them through the uh, neural network. This gives a prediction, which at the beginning is really bad. Then we compare that with the original images, and then this gives us an error. We calculate the gradient, and then we do gradient descent to update the parameters of the model, and it starts doing better and better. And this process repeats for um, all the data a lot of times. And then uh, once we have this model, what we can do is inference, which is basically show new images to the model and it will uh, perform the task on these new images, the, the denoising task. Uh, the first architecture we tested was um, based on the work by May on deep learning based scan text deep learning. And this basically performs a, a pixel level regression. So um, by passing the, the, the noisy and the uh, original images, this model learns the inverse of the, of the, of the noise transformation that, or, or the, yeah, the noise transformation that the images are subject to due to the interception process. So it does the inverse and then uh, it predicts the, the original image from the noisy images. Since we're dealing with regression here, um, 
we use um, uh, min, uh, minimum square error loss uh, on a pixel level. And we can see how these uh, loss decreases when we train this model. So that means this model is actually learning to make the pixels of the outputs more and more similar to the original, uh, to the original pixels. And um, some particularities about this model are that it uses residual, residual connections, which is something really important in most of uh, these type of models um, to, allow, to allow us to train big, this, these big models without um, having the, the gradient die in the back propagation process, which is a particularity of these large models. So the, these uh, residual connections are really important. Uh, the second model that we tried was uh, is called FC Hardnet and it's based on the work by Chao on efficient image classification. And it basically has an encoder decoder structure. This means that we take the image and we pass it through a series of convolutions that reduce the dimensionality till we have uh, a feature map which is way smaller than the image and that summarizes the important information about the image, which is in this case, the pixels that are text for us. And then we pass that, we, we, we do a deconvolution process to um, upsample again, the, the, this feature map into uh, an image. At the end, um, the output we have is uh, pixel labels. So it will tell us what each pixel, what class each pixel belongs to, whether it, if it belongs to a character, or it belongs to the background. And we use cross entropy loss in this case. Uh, we, I'm going into a little of that, but uh, that, that's the loss we use. And we can see in the plots how uh, first loss is decreased and how also the accuracy um, for each one of the classes is incremented. That means we're uh, at the end, we're detecting uh, pixels that belong to the characters uh, with a 60% accuracy, which is, um, we'll see what that allows us to do in the next slides. Finally, once we have these models that are able to denoise the intercepted images, we pass them through uh, widely used open source OCR uh, model, uh, OCR algorithm, which is called Tesseract. And uh, this one is basically has, has four main steps. Uh, the first one is adaptive church holding, which is um, probably what uh, it has the most trouble with when we pass it the, the intercepted images because they're really noisy. Then it does a page layer analysis to find where the text is, where uh, each, each line is. And then it does a baseline feeding to recorrect this queue of the images. And then um, it passes that through an LSTM, which is another type of neural network, uh, of recurrent neural network that also slides through the text, detecting each character. And one particularity here is that each character detected serves as an input to the next step. So that text has certain, um, yeah, it has, um, so that, yeah, the, 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 the output of the previous, of uh, the, the current character being detected is an input to the, to the for, for detecting the next character. And then um, these are the results we obtain. Uh, we're measuring how good our denoising is using peak signal to noise ratio. So we start with an average uh, PSNR of 7.363. And this decreases, this uh, improves using the convolutional neural network, the first convolutional neural network to 9.7, but it's even better with the FC hardnet uh, to this uh, level of 12.4. And we can see some examples here of how different types of um, input intercepted images can be denoised. Finally, um, this allows us to perform OCR, and uh, the, metric that, the metrics that we use here are basically precision, recall, F1 score, and accuracy. And um, we can see how uh, the original images, of course, have a really high accuracy and F1 score. Um, this decreases enormously when we, do, when we try to do OCR with the intercepted images. Uh, it can barely detect any character. And, and then it improves a little with the uh, first convolution network we, we saw, but it definitely improves a lot with the FC hardnet. So our regression neural network uh, is a little more, it's a little 
at, at like it's, our classification around the world is way better at the at this task in this particular case, and it's even faster because it's uh, it's a smaller network. Um, at the end, we can pass new images, uh, denoise them, and extract actual text from all of these images, as you can see uh, in these examples. And so, yeah, to wrap up, um, the traditional methods make it difficult to pre-process these intercepted images. Um, in our work, we have created a data set of 18, around 18,000 sharp noisy image pairs uh, that are aligned. Mm, two models were trained. Uh, first, the denoising the blurring convolution neural network, which performs a pixel level progression, and then the FC hardnet, which performs pixel level classification. Uh, the results, as we saw, improved the PSNR, uh, and the best results we obtained them for the FC hardnet. And finally, this allowed us to perform character recognition, and the results can be seen in the improvement in the in the F1 score and the accuracy um, in the character recognition. And um, something that this proves is that information can be effectively retrieved from EM emanations. Hence, this is today an active security threat. Um, these are uh, some of the references. And I thank you a lot for your patience and your attention. Thank you very much, Santiago and Juan, for this amazing presentation. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat, but uh, you know, I would want you to keep it short and quick, maybe like in five minutes, you could answer those questions if you have, because just to keep uh, the interest of time. So you could have a look at the questions. Yeah. Yeah, I have a look at some of the questions. So first question, uh, how can we protect the hardware from the stated attacks? Uh, please share the common standards and operating processes which are affected against RF attacks. So. I will say that uh, maybe shielding filters, impedance matching, and hardware level between the cables and the impedance of the screens and impedance of the video interface of the computer are the main tools you have to protect against this. Uh, as I told you, Tempest a standard is a military standard, and it is known, although, although most of it is secret, uh, it is known that uh, this equipment is very expensive, so you cannot protect as a as a military as a military level protection. But maybe uh, the short answer is maybe if you have a, a, a an X brand display monitor, go with the X brand uh, cable. That will help you. Okay, uh, how far was the SDR from the cable? As I show you, it was five meters. Uh, what equipment do we use to recreate the structs of information? I told you it was an SDR. Um, how, are, how are you capturing the HDMI signal through the hacker ref? It's very strange because capturing the wire signal seems not possible through the hacker ref. Uh, it is possible. Maybe uh, when you are thinking in HDMI, uh, you are thinking in the digital uh, interface and it is, it is true that the clock of this digital interface is 10 times faster than the uh, pixel frequency. For example, if I have full HD, uh, we are transmitted uh, the pixel clock frequency was 148 megahertz and for transmitted, uh, transmitting and at this resolution on HDMI, we have to achieve a, a, a a clock rate of 1.5 gigahertz, something like that. But anyway, that that's not what mean, what we care about because we are anyway trying to get pixel shapes. So again, it, it, this works the same as VGA. So the bandwidth will be the same. And I can assure that this works also on HDMI. So uh, what happens when we are, there are multiple screens in the surrounding, okay. With, with multiple screens, uh, that depends on the, on the antenna. If we are not using a, di a directive antenna, probably w there will be constructive and destructive interference between the several uh, display monitors and several 
uh, video interfaces that are transmitted at that time. But if we are using a directive antenna, this will work. This is an experiment we are going to do in, in a near future. So uh, can you please share the step-by-step -step guideline with the equipment part numbers? Okay, the equipment, as I told you, was an SDR. You can use a hacker ref. And uh, there is an open source tool you can use for this. It is very known. We are de developing our own tools, but uh, I don't know if you, I can share the, the open source tool. You tell me, Antrish, if this is possible in the chat. It's okay? Yes, you can share. If it's an open source, you can definitely let people know. Yeah, it's open source. I will, I will share it uh, in, a moment, in a moment. So, um, Da, da, da. What is the minimum size for? Okay, that's I think it's a question for Juan. What is the minimum size one you can recognize with FC Hardnet? Um, this is a tricky one because um, the minimum size we recognized was uh, 30 points, and that's a little big, but it depends a lot on the hardware you use to capture the 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 actual images because if you have a really good hardware and, and you work a lot on that part then you will have a really good reconstruction otherwise you will have so much noise that it will be impossible to recover any data the the, the snr will be uh, too bad so um, it depends more on the on that on the snr than on the on the actual size like it, the limit is more on on what on what type of data we can capture with this uh, setup and the next question was, is it better? Uh, no, I think that's what, what is the minimum size font? Oh, that, that was already. I think this was for you, Santiago. Yeah. Uh, is there a better and more secure standard other than HDMI and VGA? I could say no. I think uh, these principles are the same for all of them. I have not tested, but uh, for example, VGA and HDMI are so different and anyway, we can reconstruct video frames. So I will say there is no secure, no, there is no more secure video interface for this, against this. Okay, this is the last question that you have. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everybody who joined us for today's webinar. Amazing presentation, Santiago and Yuan. Uh, all uh, those who registered today and attended this amazing webinar, I request you all to please send us your feedback and what would you like to hear in the future series of hardware.io webinar. Uh, I'm pasting the link of the feedback in the chat option so you can quickly uh, use it. And uh, this presentation is recorded uh, and it would be available on our YouTube channel after some editing work uh, as well. So yeah, thank you all and stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.